Good evening, and uh, thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, welcome to the Creative Writing International Program and Beverly Rogers, Carol C. Harder Black Mountain Institute Alumni Reading Series, our second event this spring. Um, thanks to the Rogers Foundation, the College of Liberal Arts, BMI, and everyone involved in making this series happen. Uh, please take a moment to silence your cell phones and electronic devices, and uh, please remember what a wonderful literary season this is. It's, it, it's, I think, the fullest I can remember ever happening on our campus, actually, thanks to BMI. On April 12th, we look forward to a presentation on translation by Cities of Asylum writer Ahmed Naji. And on April 21st, we have an event no one who cares about books and writers should miss at the Beverly Theater downtown, when one of Egypt's most preeminent feminist poets and activists, Iman Mersal, will be reading. Please mark your calendars for these upcoming events. About this evening, after the reading, there'll be time for questions and answers, and books will be available for purchase and author signing through the writer's block. Thank you again to writer's block uh, 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 Drew Cohen, Drew Cohen from the writer's block at the book table. Uh, I don't know what we would do without their support and we're very grateful for it. Um, let's take a moment to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the ancestral lands of the Nuwuvi or Moapa band of the Southern Paiute people. Everywhere we walk in this part of the world is in their tribal and communal space, never ceded by any treaty or agreement. We encourage everyone to engage in a shared stewardship of the land, in active learning about the historical realities of colonialism and the indigenous peoples who continue to work and live here since time immemorial. So thank you. This evening, <clears throat> it's heartwarming to welcome back to UNLV <clears throat> fiction writer Clancy McGilligan and poet Marianne Chan, <clears throat> who earned their MFAs here in 2015. I'll introduce Clancy, and Claudia uh, will introduce Marianne. And I hope it's okay to share that Marianne and Clancy are among our most memorable workshop romances. <laughs> now, Clancy was the shy one, the more reticent, the one who most easily blushed. <laughs> he is. Um, and Marianne was much more talkative, the outspoken mover and organizer, including for a time our creative writing program as, as its MFA coordinator. Their wedding in Las Vegas has felt like a celebratory capstone ever since. It was a lasting, bonding experience for our whole community, and we still remember it that way. We still miss them as they moved on to earn their PhDs, including many awards and fellowships at Florida State University, and where Clancy, after my own heart, organized the Graduate Assistance Union, which I hope soon all GAs on this campus can also do. Um, and furthermore, they've now brought along with them uh, a, another gift to our world, 16-month-old Ines. So <clears throat> MFA programs are good for a lot of things aside from writing. Clancy McGillian is the author of the novella History of an Ex Executioner, which won the nationally prestigious University of Miami Press Prize in, in 2020. It's a remarkable existentialist narrative with a stark power of voice that for me actually called to mind Albert Camus and Par Lagerqvist, um, especially for its kind of interiority. And yes, you're in the interior of an executioner for the whole short novel, and it's really worth it. Clancy worked as a journalist and for NGOs in Cambodia before attending the MFA program here, and I hope he's still working on, or will return to working on, perfecting the promising novel that was his thesis titled Return, or a new novel that draws from similar sources combined with that strong voice he's discovered that's capable of unselfconsciously posing the most essential life questions. Set in Cambodia, the very complex, dramatic world of expatriates, that novel to me courts comparison to the tensely plotted fiction of Graham Greene and certain passages of Dennis Johnson's Tree of Smoke. In that earlier writing and in his prize-winning novella, Clancy McGillan shows his, McGilligan shows his mastery of storytelling voice combined with closely observed characters. For his writing is everywhere gifted by an objective vision outside and beyond the author's self 
which defines and expresses its generosity. As you can tell, I'm excited to read the next book and to welcome Clancy McGilligan back home to our UNLV campus to read to us. Welcome. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, that's, and thanks, Doug, for those uh, wonderful words. Um, excited to be back. Excited to see so many friends and uh, to be in Las Vegas, which Marianne and I have a really deep affection for. So that's great. Um, so tonight I'm going to read from something new. It's a work in progress. Uh, it's a novel in progress. The working title is called Delirious Cold. And um, you don't really need to know anything about it, but since that's kind of strange, we can say that it's a, a novel about um, food and then just about difficult family members. It should just be about 10 minutes. I am in my mother's lap at a table with my father across from me. This is when I'm a child. Between my father and me is an enormous block of neon orange cheese. I know what it is, but the world is new to me and I've never eaten this food. My father picks up a stubby knife, lops off a wedge, passes it to me. My brother appears, smiling and watching with anticipation. I finger the cheese. It's springy and elastic. Gingerly, I put an end in my mouth. The taste astonishes me. It combines all the flavors I've had before. I take another bite, and another, and another. Even when I was a boy, I thought of my father as a strange personality, though I'll admit we're all strange in our different ways. He was a product of the 1960s and 70s, and he could be both maddening and charming. Known as a cunning businessman, he relished playing the buffoon. When he had his heart attack, I'd been living in Northern California for three years. The voicemail came from an unfamiliar number, and the audio was garbled. After listening once, I left the creamery and replayed the message while standing in the dirt lot. Did the speaker have a European accent? I called back and waited. It was the start of December, a beautiful morning in our corner of California, as it often was. Birds trilled, fog nestled among the foothills, the breeze was crisp and refreshing. This is Saskia, said the same voice, much clearer now, still accented. Who are you? I used to work with your father, she explained about the heart attack, said he was in a hospital in Milwaukee. I tumbled into the pass, into gloomy winters, the milky warmth of the factory, endless vats of cheddar. I was basically estranged from my father, had learned to keep him at a distance. In fact, my brother and sister were also estranged from him. He was a difficult person, and in the end, he treated our mother badly. He wants to see you, this person, Saskia was saying. The accent was Northern European, Maybe German, I decided. Did you call my brother and sister? He asked that I call you. Why me? I was the middle child. Was it because I made cheese, had taken up the family business, even though I'd done so thousands of miles away from him? When he would phone me, I would usually answer, that was true, but I hadn't seen him in years. Should I say you'll come, Saskia asked. I need to think about it. I'm very busy. I understand, she said, with odd equanimity, as if she actually did understand, and I wondered who this woman was and why she would assume this role for my father. I messaged my brother and sister, giving them the news. I didn't expect much of a response, especially not right away. They were more embittered about him than me. Back in the make room, I went through the motions, days, considering what I would do. As I pumped fresh milk into the small pasteurizer, my business partner, June, arrived. She was 10 minutes late, I noticed, a new habit. She avoided my eyes, which only irritated me. Did you oversleep, I asked, but softly, watching the milk course into the kettle. She whirled. Why are you nagging me? Her eyes were red, her green-dyed hair unkempt. She looked bunched up, a mass of tension. I'm doing my best here. Her best? I didn't think so, and I didn't think she thought so, but I was disinclined to argue then, or to meditate on the condition of our little company, our mounting debts. My thoughts flowed back to my father. Did I love him? Yes, part of me still loved him. I couldn't help it. This was my nature. I recalled what he'd done to my mother, how, after she'd been diagnosed with cancer, he'd refused to care for her. 
It's too much for me, he'd said, as if this were an explanation. Too much. This was the act that had poisoned our family, and the poison was still there, could suddenly sweep through me. Over the years, I'd come to see this poison as inseparable from his personality. But my refusing to see him would be an echo, a repetition of his behavior. I knew then that I would go. The flight I purchased departed the next morning. I woke in the dark, wanting to start the trip on a full stomach, and had my usual breakfast, a hard-boiled egg and a three-ounce portion of cheese, or five thick slices. Seated at my kitchen table, I gave myself over to the pleasure of eating, which could always restore and enliven me. It was a pleasure shaped by my family, and yes, my father. Thinking of what lay ahead, and of my father's antics, I grew anxious. I debated having an extra serving of cheese, and then I kept to my routine. <laughs> I'd settled on that portion size, three ounces, after consulting the federal dietary guidelines for dairy. <laughs> because I was from Wisconsin, and from a cheese-making family on top of that, I ate twice the recommended daily intake, <laughs> divided into three meals. I found it useful to have this rule, otherwise I tended to overeat. The cheese was out of range, an Alp alpine variety from Sereno, a famous cheesemaker on the other side of Petaluma. One day I hoped to make a cheese that could sit on a shelf with their products. I had a long way to go, I felt. The flavor profile of out of range was classic, sweet and nutty, yet there was a fullness, a depth of character that set it apart. This was the mystery of a good cheese. June grudgingly drove me to the San Francisco airport. I reminded her about the delivery to the co-op, the fussiness of the small pasteurizer, the way the refriger refrigerator door could catch and stay ajar. Yes, yes, Michael, she said, yawning, her eyes half closed, her affect flat. The anger she'd showed yesterday was gone. She shot me a look I had trouble reading, part sly, part bored, maybe part something else. I studied the redness of her eyes, her slouching posture. There was a time immediately after we went into business together when we would pass the evenings drinking beer. There had even been a night when we'd ended up in bed, which we'd agreed afterward was a mistake. But our enthusiasm for each other had faded, morphed into fraying toleration, and my confidence in her ability to run our small cheese-making operation was minimal now. Just trust me, Michael, she said, her manner nonchalant, and this made me more worried. My flight had connections in Seattle and Chicago, and because of the time difference, I didn't arrive at the Milwaukee airport until 10 p.m. My father was in a hospital on the east side, but it was too late to visit him. I should have gotten a hotel in the city. Instead, I'd booked a room at Grand Pass, the sole motel in Normal Lake, my hometown, a 45-minute drive north. Irritated and famished, I got in my rental and beelined for the closest drive through as I started north, with dry heat blasting from the vents and the car's tires cutting through a thin layer of fresh snow, I devoured two quarter pounders. It had been a long time since I'd had American cheese, and I knew people looked down on it, calling it scornfully processed cheese. In fact, all cheese was processed, the product of modifying milk. <laughs> Personally, I wasn't comfortable dismissing any food, however it was made. American cheese wasn't the best thing in the world, that was obvious, but it hit the spot. Gooey and salty, a dab of umami, really a perfect complement to a fast food burger. Outside Milwaukee, the highway passed fields where the brown tufts of dead crops poked through the snow. I saw a road-killed buck, its entrails spilled onto the shoulder. Also, a billboard with a mournful farmer gazing at a dairy barn and the words, feeling down, call the suicide prevention hotline. <laughs> A pall lay over the land, I thought, though maybe it was just the cold and the landscape having their effect on me. I swung into Normal Lake. The town, technically a village, looked smaller, meaner, dingier, its main drag a collection of small windowed corner bars and shuttered stores with a shallow, humble lake on one side. My mood had worsened. In fact, I was growing angry. Why? Something about returning to my hometown under these circumstances, the way I felt I had no choice in the manner. Or maybe it was the old sediment of my life being stirred up, a sediment I would rather keep down if I, were, if I were being completely honest. In the motel room, shivering, I turned up the heat and threw the extra blanket from the closet on the bed. It was only 30 degrees outside, but I was no longer accustomed to the cold. I had become soft. I fell asleep almost immediately despite the time change. I dreamed of walking along the shore of a giant lake, Lake Michigan probably. I was freezing, bedraggled, searching for something. 
Finally, I spotted an object the size of my hand. It was shaped like a donut, metallic, smooth to the touch. It was also burning hot, I realized, letting it drop to the sand. Was this what I was looking for? I woke drenched in sweat. Worried I was coming down with a cold, I gulped three glasses of water. I'll stop there. Thank you. I think I'm ready for some cheese. <laughs> I never thought about the various textures of cheese before. Um, oh, I'm so glad to see both Clancy and Marianne here again, uh, and all of the old core hope who have come to welcome them back. Um, this is an introduction to her book, a beautiful book. Everybody has to buy it and get her to sign it. It will, it, it will be worth a lot of money someday. All Heathens is a declaration of ownership, of bodies, of history, of time. Revisiting Magellan's voyage around the world, Marianne Chan navigates her Filipino heritage by grappling with notions of diaspora, circumnavigation, and discovery, whether rewriting the origin story of Eve, I was always, I always imagined that the serpent had the legs of a seductive woman in black nylons, or ruminating on what should have been said when the man at the party said he wanted to own a Filipino. Chan paints wry, witty renderings of anecdotal and folkloric histories while both preserving and unveiling a self that dares any other to try and claim it. A people in diaspora carry their original culture proudly with them to their new home. And nowhere more movingly than in Lansing Sinulog Rehearsal 2010. If no one will remember our history, then we will reenact a version every year. And reenact it, Chan does reminding us that a reenactment is also an ongoing site of an origin that can never be lost if it is living inside of a people who will not allow their history to be rewritten. All Heathens is the winner of the 22, 20, 000, sorry, 2022 Association for Amer Asian American Studies Book Award for Outstanding Achievement in Poetry the winner of the Great Lakes College Association 2021 New Writers Award, as well as the recipient of the Ohio Book Award for Poetry. Please welcome our little award winner, <laughs> Mary Ann Chan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claudia. I love you, and I really appreciate that introduction. And thanks, Doug, for introducing Clancy and um, for inviting us to come. And everybody at BMI, thank you so much. Um, it's been really great to be here um, in Vegas, which feels like home to, I think, both Clancy and me. Um, and thanks, for every, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, this is, it's really great to see everyone. Um, I thought I would start off by reading a, a really new poem. CJ, okay, sorry, I haven't seen my friend CJ in a really long time. Okay, I thought I'd start off by reading a new po a poem that I wrote recently. Um, I'm really bad at writing love poems, and because Clancy and I are reading today, I thought that it would be an appropriate time. <laughs> he just rolled his eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> to read this poem. It's also, it also has some Vegas in it too, so um, it's fresh, so if you have any feedback for me, I'd be happy to hear it afterwards. I know Claudia will probably be like, change that ending. <laughs> yeah, probably. So this is called Anniversary. Today we walk around a garden of tombstones, German names from the 17th century. Two swans sleep beside a pond, their udon necks coiled around white feathered frames. How did we love back then, I ask? Start from the beginning. Was it 10 years ago in the desert, the stakeout, the dive of video poker and glasses of house white filled to the brim? 
Or was it after, in my apartment bedroom, broad loom carpet, broken white blinds, a girl in the kitchen frying onions, the way you pulled me toward you as we watched a film about Basquiat on my computer propped up on a stack of books? When we lived together in the desert, we walked on that unending parking lot across from the university. Even then, western water reservoirs were running dry, and I wore a floral-scented lotion to keep from becoming reptile. <laughs> My life broke open then because you loved me in the shade beneath the minute leaves of the blue palo verde. Sorry, <laughs> Clancy's face just that was funny. Okay, <laughs> he was just like. Okay, now we live near a river dangerous for swimming and you pluck pawpaws from the trees in the cemetery, peaches, American persimmons, the size of a thumb. Is it bad luck, I wonder, to eat the fruit of the dead or to enjoy what grows in a world that's dying? Do we have a choice? In this city of abandoned churches and factories, buildings vacant for 20 years, bereft of windows and workers. I wake in our living room, surprised by what grows. All right, so that's anniversary. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna read three poems from my book, All Heathens. Um, this book is about my family and our immigration from the Philippines to the US by way of Europe. Um, but it's also about Ferdinand Magellan and the narrative of the first circumnavigation of the world. So for those of you who don't remember, Ferdinand Magellan was a Portuguese explorer who during the 1500s was trying to find a westward route to the Spice Islands on behalf of Spain. He ended up in the Philippines. He tried to convert some of the native people there and um, native people resisted and he was eventually killed in the Philippines. Um, but his arrival there really marks the beginning of the history of Spain on the islands. And so in this book, I wanted to explore that early, that early violent history of colonization and think about the ways in which that history continues to impact Filipinos today, including myself and my family. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is called Elegy for Your Master, and it's for Enrique of Malacca, Magellan's slave. And Enrique was a really interesting figure in that history because, first of all, he may have been the first person to circumnavigate the world. He was taken from Malacca, brought to Seville, and then taken on the westward route to the Spice Islands. Um, and he escaped Magellan's crew after Magellan's death, and if he made it back to where he was from, he would have been the first person to circumnavigate the world, which I think is a really cool counter-narrative. Um, but in addition to that, he served as Magellan's interpreter while Magellan was in the Philippines, so Filipinos really consider him one of their own. Elegy for your master for Enrique of Malacca, Magellan's slave. There wasn't enough rain to kill him. The ship stayed afloat, your clothing darkened, practically dry beneath the stormed sun. What master wants, tuyuk, circumnavigation, to travel all the way around until you are back to where you started, until we feast on what is east, until west swallows west. He bought your body with a few coins from his pocket. He will return it when he is dead. When you are 26, your heart, a brown spinning globe. He will turn and return you, Tuyuk, back to your body. In circumnavigation, the past is in front of you, waiting to be refound, rediscovered. But you will arrive, and the people have aged. And now you pray for his soul, because he has made you Christian. And the next poem I'm going to read is called Love Song for Antonio Pigafetta. And Antonio Pigafetta was Magellan's chronicler. He was this young Italian man who wanted adventure, and he joined Magellan's voyage. And coincidentally, my family used to visit Italy all the time when my dad was in the military and we lived in Germany. And we used to visit the town where Antonio Pigafetta's family is from. And um, Antonio Pigafetta wrote a lot about where my family is from, which is Cebu in the Philippines. And so um, I thought it was only fair that I write about where his family is from. So this is called Love Song for Antonio Pigafetta, and there's an epigraph. 
The longest and most valuable narrative of the voyage was written by a young Italian who is neither a professional seaman nor humanist, R.A. Skelton, Magellan's Voyage. I consider you a forefather, Tony, even though you were from Venice and your beard held the aroma of gondolas passing through a canal. Still, I tell people you were my great-great-grandfather's grandfather. I always wanted to be Italian. When we lived in Europe, my dad would toss our sleeping bodies in the back seat of a Honda Accord in the dead of night to drive the 600 kilometers to Vicenza and buy porcelain figurines from a man named Guillermo. We'd sell them to the Filipino ladies in Germany who wanted to decorate their military base apartments like palazzos. Tony, did you grow up in a palazzo or a basilica? When I say these words, I don't know what they mean. I only know what I imagine they mean. I imagine a castle made of bones. I imagine a large pointer bounding through a bustling market. I imagine that you are my ancient ancestor, and you very well may be. In your journal, you, you wrote that you danced with unshod princesses from Zubu. My Zubuano mother is not from royal blood, but she is the daughter of a woman who stuffed adobo pork in her apron pockets to save for later. I do always go on shod, though I don't wear linen made from trees to cover my shameful parts. I would if that interested you. I would wear my hair long so the ends touch the ground. You were a tourist, Tony, and now so are we. In Italy, we bought seeds and fed the pigeons on the cobblestones, and my father would say about the locals, their manner of drinking is this, and their manner of dressing is that. On our drive home, we exchanged porcelain for a bowl of hot German soup, and I would sit on my feet and write, like you did, about our voyages. In my journal, I wrote ciao equals hello and goodbye. This is a circular word used in meeting and in parting, going all the way around, like the heads of island warriors, like the rings they wore in their ears, like a fleet of Christian ships sailing the heathen waters. So um, Andy Nicholson is here. Is Andy Nicholson here? Okay. So, and, so I'm going to read this poem because I saw Andy Nicholson, and Andy Nicholson and I karaoke together once, and for some reason, No Surprises by Radiohead was on repeat, and we like sang it every time. It was very strange. So this poem is called In Defense of Karaoke. Does anybody else here like karaoke? What's your, what's your karaoke song, Lawrence? Kate, Bo okay, classic, good. Anybody, what is yours, Rachel? Did you raise your hand? Really? <laughs> That's so sweet. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is the last poem I'm going to read. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, this is In Defense of Karaoke. But the microphone was always a cradle. Elvis and Patsy Cline, Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Sharon Cunetta, Leia Salonga, my God, your grandfather's throat was the moon. And when at the meat market the man shaves a pig's face and croons, I just want your extra time and your kiss, along with the television behind him. The body reverberates, the body echoes, aches. The lungs are your mother's kitchen where she sings Usahai, Osai, lyrics on spool past your school, past the vast pool of motorbikes, jeepneys, past the oranges, past the barefootedness, into your husband, into your son, into America, atop Lake Michigan around which you drive in your car, and trees scroll past fast, akin to the lyrics of your song. Because you always sing, I'm so excited, and I just can't hide it. <laughs> because you always are, and you always can't, you always will, will yourself to life when you have no choice or voice, unravel into the microphone and listen to yourself double. Miss your mother, father, brother, kiss their photographs, kiss America, learn to love it until you learn the lyrics by heart. Thank you so much.